Well, once you're done Magna Carta, what are we going to do next? Um, Magna Carta was not law. Um, and it was more or less very strong suggestions to the king. And of course, with an enforcement mechanism at the end of it. Um, but, um, you know, the barons go home. Uh, John appeals to Pope. Pope uh, annuls Magna Carta on grounds that John signed it under force, which he did. And the Pope's not wrong about that. Um, and um, but you know you've still got to you've still got to govern, and the the realm of England is against the king, and the king can't do much if um, if you don't come to some kind of solution. And then something that uh, may not have been miraculous for John, but certainly was for the uh, kingdom of England, and that is that John died the next year in 1216. His son um, Henry the Third came to the throne as a very young boy and uh, won't govern for time. And then after, when he does actually start to govern, he's not a very good, he's not a very good king, um, putting it gently. Um, not a very judicious or wise person. Um, we, but we begin to see the kind of the emergence of representative government because really there's no other way to govern. Uh, the kings are not going to be strong enough usually to, um, to govern without some kind of consent from the realm. And so sometime in the 1230s, we begin to see, um, we begin to see parliament emerge. Uh, it's first mentioned uh, that we know of in the 1230s and um, very quickly it becomes both a mixture of, of lords, uh, people who are barons, you know, great um, hereditary figures in the kingdom. And then what are called Knights of the Shire, which are maybe upper level, uh, upper crust folk, but who are still in some way selected by the, what we what we in America would call counties. Um, by uh, 1264, uh, a revolt against Henry III calls a parliament to uh, the leaders of the revolt against uh, Henry III call a parliament to you know, endorse what they did, and that, that's what happens. So from the beginning, the idea of parliament being a, a strong, potentially governing body, maybe not governing as of yet, um, begins to emerge. But, the, but, uh, but the, the shape of English government begins to um, show up in a way that um, people can, you know, it's, it's just recognizably, um, yeah, you know, there's a certain normality to this. Uh, and this dates far back, but um, obviously you have the king. And the king is, in some sense, uh, chosen uh, based on divinity. And this goes back into at least the 400s and maybe before that. Uh, in fact, almost certainly before that. Um, but the, so nothing can be done without the king's authority. Um, nothing exists without the king's authority. And that's not quite the way it is nowadays. But, um, and then um, the king, at a, fairly early on, long before uh, William the Conqueror in 1066, um, the idea was that a, for a king to rule legitimately, they had to consult. Uh, and uh, we've talked about that in earlier videos. Uh, and so something like a council forms around them. And after William the Conqueror, uh, the idea of a council becomes more and more common, more and more organized, more formal. Um, but sometimes just having a, a council people, um, you know, your trusted uh, barons and people like that, trusted bishops, what have you, um, sometimes you need to have a bigger body of people. And so there emerged, uh, not that terribly long after we're in the conquer, the idea of a great council. And that is, it's, a, it's a, a, what's called a forced council. And we're gonna know what the word of forced means um, later on, but, but essentially the council is enlarged into being at times, uh, at, uh, at times of uh, when the realm is under stress. Um, you, you may want to call in more people than are just in your council and consult with them too. Obviously, in a world without roads and bridges and stuff like that, 
um, local areas can go off on their own without um, asking the king, you know, anything. Uh, and so you want to get, you know, you want to bring the realm together. Uh, it's a way of consolidating the realm. Um, and so um, eventually the idea of king, the king has his council in his great council. Okay, and so it becomes more formal. And then uh, parliament, of course, is uh, an important part of this, but it's somewhat different. Um, parliament uh, has, you know, certainly emerges, uh, as I've said, in the 1230s, although we don't know a great deal about those parliaments. Um, and, uh, but by, by 1295, um, you get what's called the model parliament. Um, and uh, this is, you know, the, the processes and the formal, formal uh, aspects of parliament become pretty well established by 1295. Uh, this is done by Henry III's son, Edward I. Henry III had seen, um, Henry III had been uh, almost tormented by opposition to him at, uh, at times. Uh, he was in charge and at times parliament was in charge and at times people revolting against him were in charge. And so it's chaos. Uh, what do you do with the great council and the council? And, uh, you know, if, if you, if parliament's in charge and what happens to them? And so um, uh, essentially uh, Edward I decides, well, this is a, you, you can't govern like this. Uh, and they established what, what in 1295 is called the model parliament, as I just said. Uh, in 1297, Edward I goes one step further and says, um, okay, and I'm going to authorize as law uh, Magna Carta and something called the Charter of the Forest, um, which is a, a predecessor, immediate predecessor to uh, Magna Carta. And so um, they become part of law. Now, there's still pieces of Magna Carta. Three of them uh, are still part of English law. Um, the first one says that the English church is free and independent. Um, and the other two uh, items are not very much, uh, not, uh, well, I can't imagine them having much importance. But still, now you've got Magna Carta plus the uh, Charter of the Forest um, have now become the law of the land and uh, the very important now that it's been rewritten uh, uh magna carta of course reissued 1216 reissued 1217 reissued and considerably modified 1225 and then uh, here in 1297 certainly uh, reissued again and when kings wanted to indicate that they were good kings that they would follow the law and do things such as that they would reissue pieces and bits and pieces of Magna Carta uh, in one shape, form, or the other. And um, that was their, their way of saying, well, I'm a good king. I'm going to follow the law. Um, uh, and Parliament, particularly the Lords, um, began to have more and more say over what happened inside the kingdom. Um, that doesn't mean that commons doesn't exist, and we'll get to that in just a second. Uh, but certainly, um, the kingdom was governed by the king. The king existed inside a council. The council and existed inside a great council. And then uh, the great council would exist inside the, uh, the lords, inside parliament. Why was parliament called? Mostly for judicial reasons. Um, the, uh, the lords would issue judicial opinions. And, and uh, as, as England moved along and the economy became more sophisticated and complicated and the, the society became more sophisticated and complicated, you had more and more legal issues and, and parliament, but particularly the lords, um, began to make, the, make judicial decisions. So, and then they would be passed up to the great, up to, well, usually up to the council because the great council was usually not in session. Uh, and then if the great council, if the council approved, then the king would, of course, um, probably agree to. Uh, king always had the right to overturn a decision. Uh, and, um, and when queens come along, they do too. But um, by and large, 
the idea, the uh, English government functioned by a series of steps. Most things would not make it to the king um, because it was decided nobody would say, yeah, I want to appeal to the king. Um, but then there's this little matter that, as I said, the economy and society is becoming more sophisticated, more complex. So you begin to get great merchants, you begin to get uh, local leaders of various types, um, and, and you, have to, uh, you begin to get people who have a great deal of land uh, and who don't happen to be a lord. Uh, and they have problems too. So the House of Commons begins to evolve. Um, and you notice I have kind of like dotted lines around the uh, House of Commons here. Uh, commons literally meant the community. Uh, that's where the word comes from, uh, the community of the realm. And so uh, if even if you were not a lord, even if you were not an aristocrat, if you were a local leader or, or a wealthy person or somebody who owned a great deal of land, uh, you might have some real issues uh, going on. Now, obviously, if you were a serf, you, uh, you might not, um, at least not anything that would make it to, um, to this level of government. Um, but, the, uh, but the great non-aristocrats would submit petitions. These would be, uh, and uh, they would be go up to Parliament, uh, sometimes directly to the Lords, and the Lords would find it convenient at times to summon the uh, the realm uh, to summon the, the non aristocratic leaders, and that's how Commons comes into being, and also how laws come into being. Uh, oftentimes, laws and perhaps most of the time laws come about because there's a petition rather like a bill in the US Congress. And that petition would go up and be passed by commons or be sent by commons uh, and then be, uh, go to the Lords and the Lords would approve it or not. And then it would go to probably the council. Again, the great council probably would not be meeting. Um, and then eventually to the King. And that's how, that's how our lawmaking procedures came about. Uh, and um, in each instance, uh, they saw themselves, the different rings of government saw themselves as being a force. Uh, and what does that mean? Well, the council, uh, uh, the regular council, which was around the king fairly regularly, would force itself, that is, would bring in more members to the great and become a great council. And the great council could and regularly did. Uh, a force itself by bringing in, you know, the lords of the realm into a parliament, and then the uh, what would become the House of Lords would a force itself by bringing in the commons, the community, uh, and so essentially, the the you know the idea is is that there's always this king who governs 24 hours a day, 365 days a week and a council who is pretty much at his beck and call, and then a great council, which is sometimes needed, and then of course parliament, which is often needed, uh, and particularly for matters financial and uh, judicial. And then uh, sometimes the, the um, parliament would force itself by bringing in the commons uh, or representatives of the com uh, who represent the community of the realm. So that's how the system worked. And it worked fairly well. Uh, it wasn't always necessarily a, um, you know, everybody sitting around saying kumbaya. Uh, in fact, much of the time it wasn't. But um, for most of the uh, period of time before what is called the War of the Roses, um, the English government functioned. And um, people may not have always been happy, but it functioned. Uh, and that was key. And in the case of Edward II, uh, in the 13th, when uh, Parliament gets rid of Edward II as I'm killed, um, although we're not 100% certain how he was killed, uh, had him executed uh, in 1327, um, you know, they, they, it worked. And that's what, as I like to say, that's what the paying customers want, wanted. And by 1341, the separation of parliament 
uh, into um, two houses, official separation. By 1341, there is an official separation between lords and commons. Uh, it becomes not just a matter of convenience, it becomes a matter of, of basically law. Um, but that doesn't mean that the commons are very powerful, they're not. They are still basically uh, there just to uh, listen to what's going on above them and to submit petitions. Um, now, over the years, this is going to grow. Uh, and, and it's going to go pretty quickly and pretty soon you're going to have a speaker of the commons uh, so that commons can, the, the realm can speak to the king without the speaker being executed uh, for treason. And, and that's really what the role of the speaker, at least in the early days, was. They, the speaker spoke not for himself, but for the community of the realm. Um, well, all of this might have gone along fairly well, except for an incident of birth. Um, and that happens to be that Edward III, uh, who governed from 1327 to 1377, and generally governed at least reasonably well, although toward the end of his realm, he becomes um, uh, cantankerous and um, gets into considerable amount of trouble. Uh, nevertheless, something which would sound like a good thing and it was for the, for the people involved, but it wasn't for the kingship. Uh, and as you can see here, Edward uh, III has a variety of sons who survive to maturity. Uh, now, in a day when you had about 50% chance of making it to 18 uh, when, uh, when you were born, um, that's, that's, this was highly unusual. Um, but you can see here, um, Edward III has Edward the Black Prince, Lionel, the Duke of Clarence, uh, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster, Edmund, uh, the Duke of York. Um, these folks are, you know, they all have a piece of the kingship. They all have, at least have an, a right to heir, to be an heir of the king, to maybe succeed to the kingship. Uh, and of course, as you can see here, Edward the Black Prince, uh, the eldest son is not king. He dies before his father does. Um, but Richard II, his son, becomes throne, becomes heir to the throne. And then Richard II is a first-class jerk. And maybe not 100% well upstairs. And in 1399, under compulsion, he steps down as king. He's killed probably in February of 1400. You know, we don't know whether he starved to death or whether somebody held a pillow over his face. We, we don't know. Um, then um, the throne passed to uh, John of Gaunt's son, John of Gaunt, the Duke of Lancaster's son, Henry IV. Uh, and they're going to govern for, for a long time. The House of Lancaster, as it's called, is going to govern for a long time. And then it's going to go to Edmund of York's uh, heirs. Um, and uh, you can see Edward IV uh, down on the bottom left-hand corner there, uh, who takes over in uh, 1442, uh, less 1442 to 1483. Um, but there's a problem. Okay. You notice at the very top here, it says the War of the Roses, descendants of Edward III simplified. Lots of people had a claim on, to that throne. And so how are they going to settle this? Well, the king is still the center of everything. And so how you're going to settle it is, um, well, one side is going to conduct military uh, affairs against the other side. Uh, people are going to find ways to lay claim to the throne to, to be the legitimate heir or have legitimacy. It, the dependence that the king in the center there, the dependency of the um, of the kingship kingdom on one person um, to make everything legal uh, turns into this tremendous uh, series of um, conflicts. Um, not any one. It's not like the American Civil War where you have one side and the other side and they do battle until one side wins. Rather, what happens is you have a series of battles with no real coherent, cohesive 
this between them. It's just simply the fact that everybody's got a claim. And if you've got a claim, you can get people to back you. Uh, and if you get people to back you, then you can go to war or you can go for, for, to a battle. Uh, and so it, the whole system comes unglued. Uh, Parliament actually gains a considerable amount of, of power during this period of time. Um, but as of the, um, as of the um, end of the 1400s, the Kingdom of England is in serious, has serious problems. And it's called the War of the Roses, by the way, because the House of York was the right white rose, that was their symbol, and the House of Lancaster is called the Red Rose. Um, there has to be a way out of this mess because all those heirs, and, and there are many of them, um, somehow or another, you have to get this under control or England is going to literally come apart. And so you need to do something. And uh, what that something is, what emerges is somebody's going to win and they're going to be ruthless enough to impose a somewhat different form of government. Um, anyway, thank you very much. Uh, everybody take care out there and um, see you in the next recording.